So, so this is part two, basically, of what did I learn at MS Build 2018. And, and last month we saw things with Visual Studio, Dennis and Danny showed that, and there were a couple other presentations. I, I've been to some other technology conferences, and I really liked the MS Build conference. I thought there was a lot to be learned there. Um, you know, the new products coming out and just the vision, and I, I thought it was very time well spent. And, and I found myself spending a lot of time on the kind of the expo floor room where they have all of the uh, stations set up where you can talk to experts, uh, you know, whether it's Visual Studio, Team Services, or Azure, um, or some of the Office products and Graph. And I, I found that really useful, just talk one-on-one -on -one with, with some of the developers and, and just gain some insights from that. But um, just a lot of talk about Azure. Azure IoT in the keynote addresses. Um, Sachin Nadella, did I pronounce that right? I think I get that wrong, but um, he, he, he spent some time talking about the importance of Azure, the platform, you call it the, uh, the fabric, the Azure fabric, um, and all of the pieces that are part of Azure. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit today about the MX chip, which is just one of many devices that you can hook up to uh, the Azure IoT platform. Uh, it's a dev kit, uh, so the, the MX chip, um, see this looks like, uh, this is Tony's, right? Do you want the lights back on while you're showing that? No, that's good, that's okay. Yeah. Um, so we have the MX chip and then there's a Raspberry Pi and lots of devices that are certified to work with Azure IoT. And so with all the talk about this, why, why do we even care about it? Um, first of all, it's estimated that by 2020, there's gonna be 25 billion IoT things connected to the internet, sending data up. And so that's a, that's a huge number of devices. Uh, again, in the keynote, he talked about maybe nine billion new devices coming on this year alone, uh, microcontrollers that would be in industries, um, uh, from healthcare to manufacturing. And Microsoft sees this as a huge business opportunity, and so they're dumping a lot of resources into being able to support all of these devices coming online and to be able to support billions of these things. And then, as was pointed out also in the keynote, that for us as developers, these are, these are big opportunities if, if we're interested in them. And, and there's a lot of data coming online because of these things, is feeding data in. And we know that data is king. And it's been said that data has gravity and computing, computing resources will migrate toward where the data is. And so th these, are, these are huge um, opportunities, again, as, as they point out, for Microsoft starts business and, and developers. And for me, I was just interested. I'm thinking, well, I wanna, I wanna hook something up to the internet. I wanna get one of these IoT things, you know, whatever that means, and hook it up and start doing something with it and see if I can connect and make something interesting happen. So uh, Azure IoT kind of consists of several different underlying Technologies, uh, which which is IoT Central, uh, IoT Hub, IoT Sphere, IoT Edge. We'll get into a little more detail on these. IoT Central is really a software as a service application where this thing is ready to go. You get on there, and and once you hook your device up, it provides tools to manage your things, your devices, whatever those are and you don't need a lot of expertise to do it. It's, uh, it's prepared for, for industries to, to man manage all of your hundreds or thousands of devices and people that don't need, again, a lot of expertise to be able to do that and to analyze it and to enable or disable or to set up events on, on devices. Uh, you can set up triggers and events to kick off other processes. Um, Again, central management, and basically to visualize uh, what your devices are doing and the information that they're feeding back. IoT Hub is, is kind of the underlying technology. IoT Central is built on top of these other 
technologies because it is the applic an application uh, used on top of the, the Azure platform. And so I IoT Hub is really designed to ingest lots of data, the telemetry, which is the data coming from these devices up to the cloud. And then it provides storage for them, uh, security to be able to make sure that you know what devices are, are attaching to your Azure platform. Um, the management, it looks like some overlap here, right? What I just talked about the IoT Central because Central is built on top of <coughs> IoT Hub. Uh, there are SDKs that are available for C, C Sharp, Java, Python, Node. And again, it allows you to configure, manage, and monitor massive amounts of, of devices. IoT Sphere is the security that's being built around these devices. So you have all of these, these connected things and how do you secure them? And uh, there's registration IDs for each device so, so you know what is connecting to it. So that's the security part of it. And then all of the talk about IoT Edge, which is um, kind of a runtime that, that can be downloaded back to a device if it supports Edge to it, it's it, the models are trained in the cloud and then deployed back down to the device so the device itself can make decisions so that you don't have to you don't have that lag time of the device collected data send it back up to the cloud and then the cloud looks at the data analyzes it and says well you need to turn this off or you need to create another event but <clears throat> that can happen on the device itself and it can decide what has to happen at the point of where the data is collected. And so that's kind of the, the edge part of, of Azure IoT. And also the filtering of, does my cursor show up? No, it doesn't, okay. The uh, filtering of data too, it will, uh, do you need to send all of the data that a device collects? And it's kind of like, you know, information pollution going across the network. You don't have to send it all. Maybe the device can decide at the point of collection what it needs to send up to. And um, you can deploy updates to millions of devices in minutes using the edge technology. So anyway, what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about the MX chip dev kit, first of all. And this is, uh, it's kind of cool. It, uh, Back up here. It, it has a little, uh, it has some sensors on it to collect environmental data, humidity, temperature, pressure. It has a couple of buttons, an A button and a B button. And then it has this little screen, which is really handy because you can get some output and see what the device is doing and get some feedback and information that you might need to configure it. Um, and then it has some indicator lights. Uh, it says here there's a, there's a Wi-Fi LED over on that lower right-hand side and the Azure. So these LEDs show you if it's actually connected and working. And again, just a list of other features that come with the MX chip. And I, I think I got it for $39 or something. So. And the reason why, another reason I went with this was because when I went to talk to some of the experts at their Azure IoT stations, at least two of them had, had this same device. And, and so we chatted about it. One was looking at it and using it for an agricultural type of application to collect environmental data in the field. And um, the, other, um, the other developer was just saying, this is a quick way to get on to the Azure IoT platform. And so that was, uh, that was kind of what I was looking for, some kind of little gadget to hook up and get going with. So I'm gonna talk uh, first about IoT Central. In order to, the, the quickest path I found to be able to get the MX chip up and, up and going. So again, this is, this is the chip and you can come up and see that a bit. Maybe I can turn the camera on here and show it to you here in just a second when it starts up. And Azure IoT Central as, as an application lets you create, either simulate devices 
such as Raspberry Pis or this MX chip or some other Windows Core devices. And so it's really nice to be able to get up and, and going quickly. Even if you don't have the device, you can start simulating it and learn how to use IoT Central and create a, a resource where once you do connect your device, you, you have kind of um, events set up and um, Oh, what else? So that you can call other uh, other applications from that. Um, first of all, in order to set up IoT Central, you need to have an Azure Portal account, and your if you have your MSDN um, subscription, that kind of comes with that. And I think maybe a lot of you do have that. Everybody's Everybody has that, so you get your hundred and fifty dollars. I'm just going to go through a couple more slides, and then I'll actually go into live demo mode here. And so when you get onto your Azure IoT Central, you'll create a new application and uh, tell it what, what type of app you want to make, whether it's a dev kits or a custom app or uh, some other samples that they have available. So let me hop out of this and move over here. So of course, the, your Azure account, you need to have that because you're going to have to hook this up to a, a service plan. Uh, once you start up IoT Central. And then when we go to apps, azureiotcentral.com, you'll be presented with an option to create a new application. I created one here, Demo Stuff, uh, just to show you that you don't have to worry too much if you create one you don't want, because you just go in and delete it. See, I don't want that anymore. And then this is one I created previously. So basically, creating a new IoT Central, you're going to want to do a free one. And you'll notice that after your grace period has ended, it, it charges $500 a month to use IoT Central. So, so it really is, yeah, you, you don't want to continue on with this thing. But you, you start off with seven days free, and then it will let you extend that to 30 days. So that's, that's pretty straightforward and good thing because we kind of, we, we had to bump this back a couple of times, and so I'm thinking, when is my trial period going to expire? I don't want to have to pay just to be able to show a demonstration here. Um, and then you, uh, if you're using the MX chip, you would select the sample, the sample dev kits and give it a name. Another demo. And create it, and then this will be your URL, another dash demo dot azurecentral.com and create that. And it'll take just a, a minute or so to provision the application and get it ready to go. So at this point, you can, uh, if you click on one of these, it will just take you to some tutorials on um, setting up a MX chip, for instance, connecting your device. And then we have the templates. Application is still provisioning. We'll give it another minute or so to complete that. And so you have templates over here that will let you go right into a simulated device without having to hook up anything at this point. And then just different ways to manage the devices. Of course, it showed you can delete it here. And there we go. So the MX chip, this template, uh, as it says, it's simulated. And if I select that, I can go right in and see all of the um, parameters that are being collected that are set up on Central in order to collect data from the MX chip. You have accelerometers, um, which are basically detecting G-force motion. You have a gyroscope, which is the orientation of the, of the chip, you know, so however it's oriented. You have the um, magnetometer, which tells you kind of a compass directions. And you collect that information, uh, humidity. So these, uh, these will turn on or off the, the uh, visual graphics over to the right here. And so I'll turn on humidity, turn on pressure, temperature. And you'll see it'll, it'll about every 30 seconds it updates 
and when the device is actually plugged in it sends it up every second and then takes an average or you can decide you want a minimum maximum some count uh, when you select the edit option you can you don't want to, in, at this point, change any field names, but you can change minimum and maximum values that show up on the graph, what you're kind of looking for, and change the color, of course, if you want to do that. So there, there's a lot of settings that you can change here visually in order to, um, to look at the graphs, uh, line graphs, smooth, or step graphs. Okay. So the, the next option that we need to look at is how do I actually hook up my real device to the, um, to the telemetry for IO, IoT Central. Um, again, as I explained, we have temperature, humidity, pressure, magnetometer, accelerometer, gyroscope. You can set up states, events, and rules. The rules would tell you that, for instance, when I hit a certain, uh, a certain temperature value, I'm gonna send an email out and say, hey, you know, your refrigerator has just hit 80 degrees Fahrenheit, so maybe you wanna come and see if there's a problem with your fridge. And so that's where the rules would be set up. And just for example, I, wanna, I would wanna set up a new rule using the telemetry and heat alert. Turn those on and then you start setting up conditions. So temperature, select an operator greater than and put in a value. These, these are actually, it's sending data in Celsius so I'm never good at converting that but 25 degrees Celsius let's say. And then with that condition then um, so you save that, you got to save that, and then you can set up an action after that. What do you want to do, send an email or do something else? So that's kind of how the rules work. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so let's look at setting up the real device. Um, So on, on my application and templates, under the MX chip, I have a MX chip demo reel, MX chip RV, which is the one that I have been using. Uh, the first thing that you need to do is when you uh, create the new device, create a real device versus a simulated and give it a name. Demo two. And then, very important at this point, you to connect the device, you have to get the, this connection string. So you'll want to copy that and hang on to it somewhere, you know, notepad or whatever, because you'll need that later when you, when you go through and connect it. And there's some good, good documentation here too uh, on how to connect your dev kit. And just kind of describes what the, what the dev kit is and the first thing that you'll need to do is download this um, firmware update and just to uh, select that bin and then once you download that you will plug in your device this was kind of one area that that I got hung up on a couple of times trying to get this get through to this point is just to make sure that you get the um, the firmware on the device and then uh, once that's on there it will restart the device I was going to try and bring up a, a camera here Okay, backwards, right? Mirrored. Um, so you can't even read, and plus my cord's not long enough. 
anyway, it's it's firing up. You you can see the uh, the information it's saying it's trying to connect to the internet, but um, essentially it will show up on your Windows Explorer, and then you can select that, and then you just drop that bin file onto this. It will load it onto your device, and it will restart. And then at that point, it will be a, a Wi-Fi endpoint, which you will connect to. You just go to 192.168.0.1, and it will give you a little web, a web application. So it will, it will look like this, and, and you will then select your, your Wi-Fi endpoint that you want to connect to for the internet. In this case, I would use my phone, Rick's iPhone, and then put in your Wi-Fi password. The device pin will show up on the LED screen on the IoT device. You put that in, and then this device connection string is the one that we got off of IoT Central put that in, in at that point and then you hit configure device and then it again will restart and then it will connect through to the internet and start sending data up to IoT Central. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that now. I'm going to go ahead and the, the way I like to do it is once I have the, the bin, the firmware loaded on here, how am I doing on time? Huh? About five minutes. Did I take that much time? Did I use the whole time? <laughs> My gosh, you, I, you were supposed to give me the sorry. time to cut off. I didn't. I didn't realize I was spending that much time. I'm sorry. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just start it up from a power source, and it will say connecting. And let me go back to. I'm going to go back to my device that I have connected, to, created, and connected to, which is this one. And so right now we're not seeing any data, and it is still trying to connect. Let me see. Through the through the hotspot on my phone. There we go. So I know again that's backwards, but you can you can see it's a, it has connected already, and it's showing on that top blue line of how many messages it has sent back to IoT Central, and if there's any failures, which there are zero failures on that, and then after after about 30 seconds, it will go ahead and and start taking an average. So we start seeing data showing up here on IoT Central from the MX chip. Um, so that's one way to connect. There's uh, some other things we can do if you don't have the device. You can also connect through a node application. Let me just show that real quick just so you, you know. Um, this node application uh, will again send send telemetry up to a, a device that I've set up on IoT Central, and I better I better finish off. Are you sorry? Are, are we going? Okay, you want me to keep going just for another minute? Sure. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, I will comment that out. There's some really good tutorials too online to just help you set this up. So um, as far as uh, the telemetry being sent from here, I, if I try and fire this up, you're going to see that. Did you need to save that code change? Uh, did I not save that? Oh, I didn't. No, you're right. Let me just close this. So this is going to uh, send uh, temperature up, and a, or a random value temperature, and a constant pressure and humidity. 
And you'll notice that when I do try and fire it up that uh, it's not going to send anything right away. And that's because the church's network doesn't allow this, <laughs> this communication to happen. And so if I can find my Rick's iPhone here and connect to that, I will go ahead and... Okay, there we go. So now we're sending the data from a node application on my laptop up to IoT Central. And that is under what I set up as an air conditioner device. So this Dell real device, which is my laptop, and it starts sending telemetry. And then the third way, you can also use uh, Node or other, um, other programming languages to bypass IoT Central. This one is a simulated device, again, just like the one I showed you, that sends up temperature and humidity data. And then it also reads it as though it were a back-end device or a back-end application that would consume the data that's being sent up without using IoT Central. So that's where you make the decision on what you want to do once a certain condition is met, temperature, humidity, or pressure. And so with that, that's, I, I, it's been really interesting, and I've, I've liked the opportunity to learn about Azure IoT Central and these devices. So anyway, thank you. All right, thanks, Rick. Um, yeah, there's there's uh, a lot of applications I think for for IoT devices, and uh, I want to talk about Signal R and how that kind of dovetails into this a little bit. Uh, Signal R, if anybody's used the uh, original version for the original ASP.NET, they've now come out with an ASP.NET Core uh, version of Signal R with ASP.NET Core 2.1. But what Signal R Signal R does is it's a it's a convenient wrapper for some web technologies that make the web real time. Uh, specifically, it wraps um, three different technologies: uh, web sockets, number one, which is the preferred uh, method of, of moving data back and forth from server to client and back and forth uh, for SignalR. But if you if the device for some reason doesn't support web sockets, it will fall back to uh, some other different some d d different technologies. But before we jump into that, let's look at this. So uh, for the server, you need ASP.NET Core and the SignalR service. Uh, I was just reading about it this week that someone is, has taken the, the SignalR code and they've, because it's open source, and they're making a Node.js version of it, but I don't know what the status is or where that's at. And there's an older project called SignalJ for Java that does kind of the same thing. Um, uh, the client side, there's JavaScript and TypeScript libraries now for the, for the new one. You can use it with UWP or WPF or with Xamarin. And there's, there's some Java clients. And there's unsupported under the dotted line from Microsoft is there's Python and some Swift and some Kotlin clients out there as well. But I don't know how good those are. I haven't used any of them yet. Um, there's a couple of payload protocols. Uh, JSON is the default, but you can use another one called Message Pack, which is kind of a, it's, it's a little bit like Protobuf or some of those other different protocols. It's a binary protocol. It's smaller and faster than, than JSON, and it's, it's, it's a convenient way to move binary data back and forth. So if you need that kind of speed, uh, they do support message uh, pack out of the box. And they've just added another one, a streaming one, which I haven't had a chance to play with, but it looks kind of interesting uh, for being able to stream raw data uh, to and from the, the server and, and the clients. <coughs> so, <coughs> in order to use uh, SignalR, this is, this is what you need to do in your startup CS file in ASP.NET Core. Uh, under the services section, you need to add SignalR. It's pretty hard. Uh, and then, in, in the configure section, you need to use SignalR, app.useSignalR, and then you need to provide a route. And uh, so, routes.maphub, what type of hub, game hub, uh, and then it's going to listen on slash API slash game hub or whatever you want it to do. That's, that's kind of how you map it. So the hub is really the core of everything that happens in SignalR. 
And just like a wagon wheel and, and spokes like that, the hub's at the central, and you have all these clients connect, connecting into this hub, and then the hub kind of manages all those connections and states for all those connected clients. And so one person can send a message to the hub, and the hub can broadcast that out to all the clients uh, uh, simultaneously. Is that image because it was Pioneer Day earlier? This week? Yeah, yeah. And it's also because a lot of our cars don't have spokes on them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Some of ours do, right? So anyway, it's pretty cool. So I call it Red Rover, right? It's like Red Rover, you know, send someone right over type of a thing. What's really interesting is like in a client, a typical client application, we'll call into an API uh, that we've written and the client can call it, make the request and the server will respond and give you a reply. But what if the server wants to make a request to the client? Well, that's where WebSockets and SignalR comes in. And so what's really neat about how this works is they each, each side, the JavaScript side, for instance, and, the, and the, the server side will have methods, and each of the clients or each of the, the sides can call each other's methods like that. So it's, it's really kind of funky. So here's the game hub that, that we'll show here in just a second. But the, the core is this hub. You, you inherit from this, this hub object, and you, in this case, we're making a game hub. Uh, and, and also in this case, I've, I've created a, a game session uh, static uh, variable and uh, where all the game session stuff is, is held. And then basically what you do is you have a couple of events that you can listen to and then you create invocable endpoints that the JavaScript client can call. And that's really the core of what the hub is and, and that's pretty much it. On the client side, it's similar. Uh, you create a in this case, a, a hub connection using the SignalR hub connection builder after you've pulled in the uh, JavaScript library. This, there's a SignalR JavaScript library. You pull it in and you create a new SignalR hub connection and you tell it what, where the, the hub is located. Remember, we set it up as API slash game hub. And then that configure logging is there if you want some extra logging and dot build. And then it's just a matter of creating a whole bunch of these, this dot hub connection dot on and whatever that method is, name that you, you set up, in this case connected, then the server can call the client and say, I'm invoking connected and I'm passing you uh, an object of, of sorts, in this case a participant object, and then it'll receive it and do something with it. And it's really just, it's just that simple. It's pretty cool. So we have a demo. It's called Brain Buffet. Uh, game for Brainiacs, and we have the, the source code for this if you want to go play with it uh, on, on GitHub, under github.com, mobile toaster, uh, signal our demos. Also, Parker has a demo that he put up there that's kind of cool as well. It's a kind of a typing game demo, a speed typing demo that, that he's included. So if you want to go look at that, that's cool. So I'm going to pop out to Brain Buffet first, hopefully before you guys. And I'm going to take the host role. And then we'll have other people connect. So I'm going to have my son connect over on this one. So you can see what, what, what we set up here and what we're kind of demonstrating is, uh, is a, a concept called groups. So e each of the clients connects into the hub, and the, and the hub maintains that connection state information with all of those clients. At the same time, you can subscribe to or join specific groups or subgroups, and communication can happen within that group or to multiple groups or, or whatever. So in this case, this little game that we've, we've set up to demonstrate this, uh, Brain Buffet, there's a host. We have two teams, team one and team two. Uh, there's four slots in each team. Looks like someone's joined team two already. Uh, and then there's plenty of spectator spots for anybody else who wants to go visit. So if you want to go join this, it's at Brain Buffet dot azurewebsites.net. So if you have your laptop or a mobile device, if you'll take a moment, connect to that. Let's, I want to test and see how many people we can, we can support on this. So brainbuffet.azurewebsites.net. So, okay, team two is filling up, filling up. The empire is filling up. They've got two slots available. <clears throat> team one has four slots available. No one wants to be on team one? That's the rebel icon. Yeah, no rebels? Four available slots. Mm -hmm. Oh, got two slots. 
one slot. Need a couple more. Who else is going to join in? I'm just getting an hourglass to see what works. An hourglass? Just hit enter. A circle thing. Okay, well, that's interesting. So there may be a bug. You keep getting back to start, too? Oh, cool. Maybe three slots are only available maximum. Maybe. I don't know. So it looks like here, I'm on the host role right now, and I see on team one, I see Jozu. Jim and Danny, and then on team two, I see Mike, Gordo, and Kyle, and Nathan, who just, just signed in. So you can see as, as people are signing in, if it's working for them, and I don't know why it wouldn't work for them. We'll have to kind of look at that and see, but um, this is our first real test, because uh, we test in production. And so thank you all for testing. Uh, but I'm sitting on this page. I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing any refreshes, but what's happening is people are, are connecting in. It's, it's calling to the server, and the server is then broadcasting the game state out to everybody uh, as things are being updated. So I'm going to go ahead and start the game. I'm going to pull up a question. I'm going to push that out to all the contestants. So we'll look out here. And the way this works, guys, is there's on your teams, um, the teams can, can chat. Within, within your group, but only the first person in who's the team captain can submit uh, an answer for this particular question. So discuss amongst yourself, and, and so you, we'll, we'll, look, we'll go ahead and peek at this. The spectators can see both the conversations going on with team one and team two, and the spectators can, can make uh, snide remarks and comments about the, the, the geniusness of each team. But, uh, so that's, that's kind of how this game is set up. So what we have is Team 1 is subscribed to a group, and they can have a private chat within their group that Team 1 cannot see. It doesn't even get broadcast to those people. And likewise with Team 2. However, every time someone chats, um, we are sending it to... So when Team 2 chats, for instance, we send it to Team 2, and we broadcast it to the spectators to let them know what's being, being talked about. So... That's the, that's the concept of groups there. So let's go back, see, has anybody submitted a result there? Okay, so now I'm gonna press reveal answer. And the answer is the one ring of power, uh, Lord of the Rings or my precious would have been an, an acceptable answer. So I'm gonna give one point to both teams. And we'll go to the next question. I'll push this out. So normally you wouldn't see this screen. You would only be looking at your screen and you wouldn't see uh, the answers pop up or any of that. But So as people are discussing that, has anybody, a quiet old man, who said that, Gordo? It's Gordo. <laughs> Danny says a nice guy. <laughs> wow. Can't remember his name. Mm, that's great. So I've got no answers submitted so far. So as the host, I'm sitting here waiting for team one or team two to submit something. Me, <laughs> something. That's awesome. Team one? Who's, who's captain team one? Who's Joe Zhu? Is that you? Are you only allowed to say one thing per question? You, you can chat all you want within your team, but your team captain can only submit one answer. Your team captain for team one is Mr. Gibby. So Gibby, if you can submit an answer. Well, we'd like to end today. Oh, the answer is Elder Gong. Good job. So this, this team gets a point. This team loses a point. So they're back to zero. Sorry, you guys. And we'll do this one more. Which temple is this? Yeah, I know you know. <laughs> Jim put these questions together for us, so. 
see what this spectator view says. Hmm. Got a couple of good guesses there. And the answer is St. George. So team one, you get six points. <laughs> team two, you get six points as well. So, okay, everybody, this is, everybody's happy. All right, so let's take a look at what's going on at the CAD. <laughs> you want, oh, you want to see the next question? Okay, that's too hard. That's too hard. <laughs> we'll leave that one up there while we look at the code, and you guys can go sneak in, in the internet and find the answer to that one. All right, so let's look at the code here. So this is, this is the code. Uh, this is the game hub on, in ASP.NET Core. And I've, I've tried to organize this so it's pretty simple to understand, but I have a block for SignalR events and a block for client invocable code. So if we look at the events, I have two events, an on-connected and on-disconnected. So as people leave, I need to clean up the game state and make sure that they're not still in the game and take them out. So I have code in on disconnected to say, if they leave, take their connection ID and clear them out, clear the game state, uh, and then send the game session update out to all the users to let them know that that's been updated. So you can see clients.all.sendAsync. Now on connected, when someone connects, I create a new participant for that person. When they come in, they, everybody has a unique connection ID, and that's how we know who they are. And so we take that unique connection ID, we create a participant object for them, and I, I send back just to the caller, just to the person who sent in. Uh, I, I invoke their connected state, and I pass that participant back to them, like that code we were looking at. And I also send them the, the current game state, which they should at that point be on that, that page where they're trying to select what role they want to be. Well, they need to know if the host role is already taken, so I push that back to them the minute they connect. Some of the other events, and we won't go into all of them, but here, here are all the different event endpoints that I've created. When a pers person selects a particular role, it invokes the join endpoint, which goes through, adds them into the game session object, reduces the count available for a particular team, and kind of sets that all up. And then, again, broadcasts that out to all the participants, the game state. And then I send just back to the caller um, their participant, participant update information that's been updated. There's a chance that they may have tried to join a particular role at the same time someone else did and they didn't quite get it. So I do a check to say, did they actually get the role? If they didn't, then we don't actually advance them and let them have that particular role. Uh, one other thing to look at, team chat. So this one's kind of interesting. So when you're, when you're chatting and you're sending your message up, uh, I say clients.others in the group for the group that they're in. So their role would be like if they're in team one, and team one person is typing, then I don't want to broadcast back to the person who sent the message, the message they just sent, right? So I can just say, he's sending a message to the group, send it to everybody but him in the group, this particular message. That's kind of what allows us, if you look at the, um, oh, I don't have it here, but if you look at the, in, in your screen, if you're on a particular team, your message that you've typed will be in green and on the right side, and everyone else's messages will be on the left side with their names in front of it. So that's kind of how I can tell where the message came from and, and, and who typed it. And so that, that's kind of a neat feature. So to be able to send it to a particular group or to send it to others in the group. So I send it to two. Uh, I send it to the, spe if you're a spectator, I send it to the spectator group. Uh, and you can send to multiple groups as well. Um, yeah. On the async sending, do you know if they guarantee that if you do two async sends to the same client, that they'll arrive in the order that you executed them on your server? Or are they just randomly going to come here? That's a good question. I don't really know. I'd have to try, play around with that a little bit. It's hard to get enough people in here testing it and hitting it. It handles so many, so many people and quite a, quite a bit of load that uh, so far it's all, it feels almost instantaneous when that stuff's happening. So it probably will execute an order, but I don't know that it's guaranteed to execute in that order. So that's a good question. Don't know. 
Here's another example where you can specify a list of groups to send to. So this, this time when I'm sending the question out, I send it to both teams, get the question, as well as the spectator gets the question. The host does not get the question because he has the question already. So anyway, that, that's it. That's kind of how um, SignalR works in a, in a nutshell. It's pretty easy. And like I said, this code is all available if you want to go look at it. Now, in the last couple of minutes, let's just talk about, well, that's great. But do we write games? We want to, maybe. But what can we use Signal R for? In fact, Jim and I, we were, we were kind of going through this yesterday morning, and Jim was asking me, this is all great, but what's a practical application for Signal R? And right on cue, uh, Joseph Keller showed up and said, hey, I'm getting ready to add Signal R to my application because I want to do blah, 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 blah for, for my application. And there was a real live example. Any of you use SignalR or have any thoughts about how you might use SignalR in your applications? I don't want to use SignalR, but I use a system basically the same that we use for logging. And we had different listeners listening to different groups, and then the events would come in and get reported either via a disk write or get reported via an email send or it would be routed based on who was supposed to receive from which channels. So it's basically a messaging system that you have. Okay, that's a good application. Any other scenarios? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, this is kind of out here. We just went live with the uh, uh, mission call through you come to the site and get it instead of paperwork. And I'm thinking you can put together like a little a group and so everybody can see the reveal at once or have a reveal party or something uh, so they're not all located in the same room. Yeah, you can do that. In fact, I, I want to play with the streaming option a little bit because in theory, you should be able, if you had a webcam, you could actually create your own streaming uh, instance or service kind of on a small scale uh, where you could stream data live across the, the web to a bunch of recipients and, and vice versa. So it's, it's possible to do that kind of thing. So that's an interesting application. <laughs> Curtis, welcome back. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Group chat is kind of like the default sample application for SignalR, and I wanted to try and avoid just group chat. But there are some other applications that, that can be quite interesting as well. So like dovetailing into what Rick is doing with like IoT, you may not want to use IoT Central at $500 a month with one device, because that's probably not practical. But you can create your own uh, SignalR application and stand it up and have it listen to IoT devices. And then as people connect, you can then broadcast that information out to them. And, and perhaps a good example would be, let's say that for like Deseret Trucking, we, want, we have GPS devices to track all of our trucks in, in all their locations real time. You could create a web dashboard that could track GPS location of, of those trucks in real time, you know, coming back to the dashboard and sending that information through kind of an IoT type of a, a scenario in, in real time. And Curtis has more ideas. <laughs> that I've used it for in the past, at least use these sorts of things in the past is for redundancy. If you've got multiple servers that are supposed to have responsibility, you can set up a cluster of servers and let them all subscribe and process those messages you know, in parallel. But if one goes down, you still have two or three other instances that are still doing the job. So you never lose your, your connection. You can have redundancy and not really have to write it in any way special. You just Get the messages reported and then if they fail, then you other instances that take over. Yeah. Well, we send out messages to students and parents from, uh, from uh, administrators or teachers within WISE. We could use it for that as well. Okay. Yeah, I think there's lots of applications for, for something like this. Again, really real time applications is where it, it really shines. There are other options for things like. Uh, messaging, like if you just want to use a message bus that where it's not mission critical real time uh, application, but if you do want real time application, uh, then this is this is a pretty cool scenario. Uh, another one that's that, and I'll just this last one scenario is if it, you have a long running uh, a, a long running application. So let's say for instance, 
every year we have planning and there's a planning site that you go to and you have to go submit a bunch of stuff and then the server has to go crunch all the, this, these numbers and it takes a little while before it comes back. The web is not real patient, you know, things time out pretty quickly. So what you can do is you can go into WebSocket protocol or, or into SignalR protocol and say, okay, I want you to go initiate this and then I want real-time updates of what's happening, you know. We've, we've cleared first stage, we've cleared second stage, we've cleared third stage. It might take two and a half minutes to complete all the processing, processing of this. Without your browser having to sit there and pull, you can have this WebSocket connection up and the server can, as it completes something, can just let you know. Let the user know that this is completed, this is completed, this is done, and now you're ready for whatever it is. So long running processes like that are good for this as well. All right, well, we're about out of time here, but um, did anyone, let's see, did we come up with an answer here? T1 is cheating. T1. <laughs> so let's reveal the answer. Ah, Meek and Lily of Heart. And Team 1 gets, or Team 2 gets two points for calling out Team 1, and Team 1 gets one point for getting the answer right. So good. <laughs> oh, what are the four types of bears that live in Alaska? Yeah. So my son did this last night, and he misread it, and he said, okay, it's Pinto, Black, White, and Garbanzo. <laughs> so anyway, all right, well, that's that. one other thing I have to say is um, we haven't talked about scaling issues. So if, obviously, if um, SignalR is, is maintaining the connection state of all the clients, what do you do if you, if you spin up two clusters? Well, there's support, they have support for Redis cache, so you can do a signalr.add Redis and configure all that if you, need, if you need to be able to cluster. The other option is Azure now has a SignalR service that you can use that has all the scaling built into it, so it can scale on demand if you need to. And you, you don't even have to have SignalR in your application, you can just call out to SignalR as a service and use their service as well. And, uh, I think that's all I had to say about that. Any questions? What's ahead? <laughs> team one gets one point. Team two gets minus one point because they didn't even they didn't even try. It's in the chat. We got right. Well, I don't see the chat. You have to submit the answer. <laughs> I, I know. Rich? <laughs> yeah, so we'll probably need to modify the application so there, there can be a, uh, you can have a, a coup and you can overthrow team captain and make someone else a captain. <laughs> all right, well, that's all I, I have. Thanks, guys. Uh, if you have any questions afterward, just, just come ask me. And again, go ahead and pull down this code, look at it, and, and I look forward to seeing what kind of things you do with SignalR in your applications. So. Where is your code? It's on GitHub, uh, mobile toaster slash uh, signal R demos. You can bring that slide back up again. I could bring up that slide again here. Thanks, Tony. Okay. Thanks, everybody.